ha how did they think about things? That, I, I think it's very important to try and find out what would occur to people. I mean, there are things that never occur to us because we live in a world with mobile phones and, and computers and that, that yeah. our grandparents would think were totally normal. And you go back 500 years or 600 years, it's even more strange. So um, you start to see this banded armour, which I think is um, rows of scales riveted onto cloth that's folded up, and you get the top of a row of scales, the folded up cloth, which gives it flexibility, then the top of the next row of scales and whatever. And the reason I believe this is what the miniatures are depicting is because real armours made this way were used during the Qing dynasty in China. So is it's it not a, like... Speed, we worked together for that Spanish magazine, I forgot, but okay, it's on our academia. And we wrote a, an article uh, about that, which is translated into Spanish. Was it that one that, um, if I remember it, the miniatures in Shahname by a Songori Shahname depicted that way? Are you talking about yeah. those ones? Yeah, there's, there's, there's some really good depictions of it and some really stylized depictions. And that's what makes it hard, because things that look beautifully done, we assume are carefully observed, but that's not necessarily true. It might be beautifully done because there is a whole tradition in a workshop of using stencils and whatever, showing something that is completely out of date. During the, the after Timur, in the Timurid period, like by Sungur and, and people like this, there was a revival of painting in the style of the Okana period. And you can get two paintings that were painted 200 years apart, showing exactly the same equipment. And the only way you can pick them apart is maybe the colours are different or some details of the functionality of the equipment is different. Today, I was looking for stuff before you contacted me uh, uh, to illustrate this. And I found a painting I'd never seen before. Uh, from uh, Hazine 2153 in Topkapi. Uh, and it showed, uh, well, it was beautifully painted. Let's say the detail was incredible. Uh, it, it had a horse archer shooting forward. He had a very strange band around his, the main part of his torso, which may have been, I don't know, it, it could have indicated armour, it could have indicated just a wrapper, because those things exist. Um, he was, he just shot, his hands are in that classic release phase. There's a person behind him with a shield, teardrop shape, huh. with a dragon in the middle in Chinese style and a beautiful Persian banding around the edge. But what struck me, what told me there was something seriously wrong with this was the bridles on the horses. There were two horses heads clearly seen and they showed Ilkhanid bridles with Timurid additions, and the painter did not know how they fitted together. So he's got brow straps attaching to trick straps that they should have not attached to, but because a Timur, uh, like a, a, an Ilkhanid Mongol bar bridle, consists of a halter with a bridle over the top of it, and uh, this is why you get the double straps in some places and everything like that. It's it's very it's still used in Mongolia. It's not it, it never went out of fashion because it works. But this artist was confused. And this is in that transition between uh, late Ilkhana Jalairid into a Koyanlu, Kara Koyanlu. Uh, um, uh, people who were using different equipment, but they inherited the artist. Because a lot of these things took over a very short period of time, a hundred years. I mean, in modern times, it's the difference between pre-dreadnoughts and aircraft carriers. But 300 years ago, it was the difference between 70-gun wooden warships and 100-gun wooden warships. Yeah. It, it wasn't a major change in technology. So when I look at this, I, 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 I kind of say to myself, well, there's something wrong here. There's, there's a, a beautiful collection of paintings um, uh, which are referred to as by Sia Khalem, black pen, right? And they're in several different styles because they're from an album, and the album was probably um, put together for Mehmet Al Fatir, 
uh, in in after the conquest of uh, Constantinople, and it included Turkmen material and all kinds of stuff, and and a, a long tradition of copying Chinese paintings from the Timurid period. But as a as an observer who has seen real objects and made copies of them to find out how they work and what constraints they put on the user. Um, I saw a lot of elaboration, like uh, a series of cloth bands in a garment will be turned into metal encrusted belts because the artist thought this is more interesting. And his patron who paid him to do this, well, that's really nice. So it's not, again, I always keep coming back to this. We're not looking at a poor version of photography. We're looking at real artists who are trying to impress their patrons. Yes. And the patrons are not um, point scoring stamp collectors saying, oh, right, this, yeah, this is much closer because it's got this and it's got that and it's got that. They're not thinking like that. They're saying, I like to look at that. It's vaguely familiar in some cases. Some, I mean, it's quite clear some artists were brilliant at depicting what they saw. And we know that because where there are objects surviving, yes. they match what the, the painter has done. But they're not looking at it the way we would. They're not trying to give us a manual on how to make armor or swords or bows. You know, it's very interesting what you're saying regarding that beat because you talked about uh, bows and also about armor. You know, it reminds me of something which goes directly in line with what you say. When I was in Iran for the first book and you, we started working together for you as an editor, and I went to Iranian museums, there were these Nasiruddin Shah collection, which they re he, really inherited from Safavid period. You know that Qajar mm -hmm. said, we are Safavid. So it was yeah. a royal collection. It was not a private collection in Sotheby's, right? And then there you see all Safavid kings with these typical Shamshir we know, right? But yeah. then I asked myself, hmm, why are these not depicted in miniatures in Safavid period? You understand what I mean? Why are yes. they always depicting something else? Then I asked some of, you know, as you said, we want to see what we want to see, what is not really there. And they said, oh no, they're all later period. I said, could it be? I remember back then before I got to know you, that the artists are just imitating an earlier pattern of you know handle could it be that just you know they just painting something and not but because the assumption for swords was the same there they look at something and they clearly depict it but no one thought about it maybe they're just imitating a school of art maybe yeah. they're just imitating a pattern as you are saying it so it's very important factor to take into consideration well, I, I think the classic example, and it refers to swords, is if you go through paintings from uh, late Timurid to late Safavid, most swords have a concave back edge. Yes. But no real swords do. No. And this is purely an artistic convention. And we've got to realise that when you look at this, <laughs> you've got to take it into account. My feeling is that the swords depicted in the miniatures are almost certainly for war and the very curved swords are almost certainly for use in contexts where armor isn't being used because a very curved shamshir if you hit someone not wearing armor will cut them in half <laughs> i mean it it's the the geometry of the blade is perfect for severing large bits of human being. Um, but the earlier slightly curved swords with the, the big yamen on them were much better for hitting people in armor. They, they wouldn't penetrate certain types of armor, but we, 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 there's a modern thing, particularly in, in Western um, armor studies, saying, well, here is a perfect armor and you can't get through it. Longbows won't shoot through this armor. Swords can't penetrate it, whatever. But of course, uh, you know, 1% of people had perfect armor. The next 20% had really quite good armors, 
and everybody else had whatever they could get. You know, so Pete, you know what the one thing which is so funny? Absolutely, one percent of people had those type of armor, but in this in the context of this HEMA or European thing, oh my armor is it cannot be penetrated. It's a Milanese. And I looked at him, okay. So what if someone takes you down and sits on top of you? So, yeah. This is not allowed. <laughs> well, I mean, the the thing that that people don't think about, none of this armor had keys and locks to stop people from pulling the helmet off and stabbing you. <laughs> and I, I, I keep thinking, uh, I, I, I read a Chinese novel uh, written in the 1400s and uh, it, it had every weapon imaginable. 108 heroes, each one was a specialist in a particular type of fighting. And one group of heroes was totally undone because they attacked the village, they had armor, they had everything, but the villagers had long poles with hooks on them. And they trained themselves how to hook the guy, pull him off his horse, and then they all jumped on him and beat the crap out of him. Yeah. <laughs> there is no defense against that. When I look at, um, say, I mean, the real problem with European plate armor was that you got heat stroke and you couldn't wear it all the time. And Henry V's arrow in the face is a perfect example. You cannot keep your visor down for the full course of a battle because you'll die. So therefore, you've got to put it up whenever you think you're safe. And of course, you're not always safe then. Um, but the uh, if, if you read Herodotus speaking about the ancient Persians, the Archimedes, he talks about the Sargassians who fought with lasses and a lasso is the perfect thing. If you got four cheap light horsemen with lassos and one knight in full plate armor, they will lasso him and pull him off his horse. Yeah. And he can't do anything about it because he he's flexible, but he's not flexible enough to untie knots. If he gets his, I mean, particularly when you look at the type of weapons, rondel daggers, which knights carry because they're really good for you know, levering your way through armor, don't have any sharp edges. Yes. So you can't cut anything with them. So you're you're in real trouble. Uh, I I I this is why I'm I'm not criticizing people who are developing um tests for armor and things like that. They're all doing important stuff. And it's it's it important research. But what I, I and some of them are, are thinking about the more complex things like what happens if you've got a thousand people charging at you and one percent of them are perfectly protected but i'm, I'm guessing that one percent isn't the front row uh they're 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 squires and men at arms of the front row and maybe they're not perfectly protected and if you're charging now european knights didn't charge at full gallop they charged at a at a um a trot or a um a slow gallop. Uh, if if your English longbowmen or your Turkish um, uh, janissaries or whatever shoot everybody in the front row and they fall over, the guys in the back run into them and they fall over too. Yes, they will. Yes. So therefore, you can't just say, well, the dukes and the princes and the kings are safe because they're not. And uh, uh, there's 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 quite a lot of studies on why things changed in Europe that show that it was ineffective. But what I always look back at and say, when did Europeans actually win fights against horse archers and, and Middle Eastern armies and whatever? And it was all in the 11th and 12th centuries when they were just wearing simple male hauberks and had kite shields and simple lens. When they got all this elaborate gear, they just couldn't move far enough or fast enough to get to anywhere to do anything. Uh, you know, it's there. There is like it's like somebody drew a line around Euro, uh, Western Europe and said, "Right, this is just too far to do anything useful." Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I think this is quite an important thing that the armies that could move, and this relates to armor. If your armor is such, uh, like. Uh, Ibn Munkir is right. Everybody took their armor off when they weren't fighting. They had servants, they had horses, 
that had pack saddles, they had, um, uh, in, in, in the Arab case, they had wicker boxes that they put their armor in because they wrecked themselves if they rode around in armor all the time. Movies give you such a wrong idea about what's happening with armor. You do not wear it unless you are about to go into battle. Uh, the only movie I've ever seen that did this was a uh, one from Inner Mongolia made with Chinese and Mongolian cooperation. And the thing was, these guys, whenever they were going everywhere, there was several pack horses with boxes of armor on them. The most they ever wore were their helmets, unless they were going into battle. And this is the most realistic thing I've ever seen. European knights were not stupid either, and they did that. But getting back to our, our people in Iran, Mongol armor, lamellar armor, I know from experience, is relatively cool to wear in a hot climate. I live in Sydney. We get summers where you get uh, 40 degree temperatures and 90% and humidity on a bad day. This is, this is frightful. Uh, incidentally, I've never worn armor on a day with 90% humidity. It's not a good plan. I'm still alive, so obviously I didn't do something that stupid. But just a um, second, uh, you in Australia also use Celsius, not like in the US, you don't use Fahrenheit, right? No, no, okay. we've used Celsius since the 1960s. Okay, that's right. So we, we went metric back then. Um, we, did a, we did adopt the dollar, Yes. but that was because the dollar was also decimal. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, no, yeah, excuse so, me. Yeah, I, I, Indeed, I pointed out because most of our viewers are from United States. That's the reason I pointed out. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Okay. Well, this is it. I mean, it's. I mean, when I'm in the US, I because I grew up using Fahrenheit, so it's. Yes. it's I, I've got a, an image of what yeah. uh, eighty degrees Fahrenheit <laughs> is. It's not. Okay. It's not a problem to convert backwards and forwards. Yes, but uh, I I found that uh, well, particularly lamellar, I found to be cool. I'm pretty certain I've never worn much mail, but mail also strikes me as being cool. The problem I see with mail is the Horbergs. The Horbergs sat on a Akaton or whatever padded garment, which sat next to the skin. And that, it, it can work to keep you cool by stopping radiant heat. Yeah. Um, and if it wicks the sweat out of your body, maybe it will keep your body cool. But uh, it's awfully like wearing thick winter clothes in the middle of summer. And uh, I mean, if, if it's going to save your life, you're going to do it. But it doesn't mean that you're at peak physical fitness. Um, so I feel that, that, that uh, there was this, this period when the First and Second Crusades and the, the um, Crusader kingdoms in, in uh, Palestine and um, Western Syria, like around Odessa and that, where small numbers of knights were really quite successful. And the, the differences between them and later knights was they can move a lot faster. Um, they did have the advantage of surprise because like cataphracts and, and heavy cavalry in, in say Byzantium and that didn't use the same tactics. They used much more complex tactics because they were used to fighting horse archers, so they knew the problems. Um, the uh, the first um, crusade, for instance, is a perfect example of culture uh, culture clash. The 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 mainly Norman part of the army had a fair idea about what horse archers and that were, because they'd been fighting the Byzantines, and uh, I mean they'd conquered Sicily. I mean we always think of the Normans in terms of the Normans who conquered England, but the major Norman presence in, in the Crusades was from Sicily and Calabria. Yeah. And they knew a lot about complex tactics. They were very, very successful. And when they went into the, the Near East, they were very successful there. They were very lucky because there was a whole group of small kingdoms fighting each other and the Seljuk um, state in Iran was really not that interested they did send armies and i mean from what i can tell from uh from uh osama ibn munkith's um references to his father and that people from um western syria fought in battles in 
uh, Iraq and in Iran. So there was this movement backwards and forwards. So people were aware of what was going on. But I mean, the, the, after Malik Shah, the Seljuk state was chaotic. The Guz invasions uh, into eastern Iran, the capture of Sanjar, uh, these kinds of things meant that, you know, you weren't dealing with strong states anymore. And even the fact that the, 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 the Khalif in Baghdad was able to reassert his independence, it's not a statement of how strong he was, it's a statement of how weak everybody else was. So things were chaotic. But in Iran, you had several things working together. You had a long tradition of mail making. You had a long tradition of using bits of lamellar or scale or whatever and i don't know about scale but i i am I'm, I'm guessing that if you have lamella you've got scale because they're, they're very closely related uh together like jaw shan over male um coats and whatever at some stage and it must have been around the time of the formation of the turkmen states and the timurid invasion somebody worked out that you could combine the two ideas and make plate and mail. So you could take what essentially looked like lamellar scales, turn them 90 degrees, and then only make holes in the ends and attach it with mail instead of lacing. Like this and this in Timurid examples we have, right? Tim armor yeah. from Timurid examples, yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that I, I don't know why it, it's I just have this feeling because the majority of the surviving pieces show this that it was a West Asian uh, development. If you read the Baba Nama, uh, Baba at one stage says that his rel his Mongol relatives through his mother gave him a suit of armor in the Mongol style, by which I assume he means a lamellar armor, but he could mean a, a brigandine because uh, 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 small plates inside, I think, was a. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the Arabic word for this because it was known in Mamluk states as well. So the idea of using small plates riveted inside a um, a garment was already known. 